uh, everyone today we are going to discuss uh, about integrated pest management uh, this is very important topic for uh, uh, jrf srf as well as the ars students so integrated pest management the name itself indicates that we are going to integrate many management practices in uh, for managing the pests the definition uh, is uh, say, uh, given by uh, FAO in 1967 that integrated pest management is a system that in the context of associated environment and population dynamics of the spe pest species utilizes all techniques and methods in a compatible manner as possible and maintains pest population below those causing economic injury. This means we are integrating what are all the techniques and methods are there in pest management into an integrated way to manage the pest to keep the pest population below the economic injury levels. Only we, we have to keep the pest population below economic injury levels, not at all eradicating the pest. So another definition given by uh, Luckman and Metcalf in 1994, that it is uh, integration of the tax ensure favorable economical, uh, ecological and social consequences. That means it's, uh, it will give pest management and, uh, uh, less, uh, in less cost and uh, less cost to uh, ecology, that is less environmental pollution and conservation of uh, uh, environment and uh, social consequences means uh, it, it will improve the uh, crop, prote uh, crop protection uh, techniques and thereby improve the economic status and social welfare in the society. So what is the need of this pest management? All the way, the whole pest management system before the IPM concept has arisen, it has many drawbacks in pest management that is especially based on the insecticide. So to while using this insecticide in an indiscriminate manner and uh, the use uh, a very uh, more usage of insecticide caused many pests, secondary pest outbreak, resurgence, and the resistance. These things has um, made an uh, approach towards integrated pest management on uh, concept. So the uh, resistance development, the secondary pest outbreak, resurgence, and the environmental pollution leads to the emergence of the concept that integrated pest management. Coming to history of integrated pest management, Michael Becker and Beckon in 1952, well, back in 1952, it is much before in um, like a green revolution in India, this uh, term integrated control was coined uh, to apply an uh, integrated approach. That means both insecticides and uh, biological control is integrated to uh, tackle the pest. Then uh, Stern et al defined integrated control as applied pest control, which combines integrates biological and chemical control. They, uh, they, in the beginning, only biological control and chemical control was integrated. Later, it, this it was accompanied by many components in the pest management, okay. In um, 1972, Council on Environmental Quality gave the term that integrated pest management. This is important point. You should note that the, who gave the term integrated pest management means Council on Environmental Quality in 1972. Before that, in 1967, FAO defined the integrated pest management that I have given in the back slides. So that definition is the most, uh, accepted definition of integrated pest management one should uh, any uh, entomologist should know that uh, definition uh, so please note that uh, definition also okay then uh, smith and atkinson uh, were the uh, one of the uh, means uh, first ufakar project will come in uh, 99 uh, 1994s then in 1997 smith and atkinson were worked on the concept of integrated pest management selecting about six crops in uh, USA. So for this uh, concept, uh, developing this concept and uh, application at the field level, they got the World Food Prize. So this is also an important point, you should note this. Smith and Atkinson in 1997 got the World Food Prize for the uh, implementation of integrated pest management at the field level. 
So coming to concept of damage level. So um, one has to take the uh, pest management means they should know the uh, what is the damage and uh, uh, what is the pest which is causing the damage and what are the pest population levels uh, they are causing uh, damage, mainly the economic damage. So uh, different, uh, so uh, the damage is uh, defined in different uh, uh, terms like Injury. Injury means uh, when an insect uh, will attack, uh, for suppose, um, like a hoppers, they, they used to attack the uh, plant, like they, they will suck the sap and uh, release the toxins. That is, uh, that, uh, that uh, toxins will make the uh, leaf to become uh, uh, dry and uh, that is called is injury. And the damage, the damage is measurable lo lossing yield yield quality that may be quality or quantity so whatever the uh, injury will cause that leads to that means if the pest will uh, harm the crop means the productivity will decrease so that uh, productivity loss in yield is called as damage so what is economic damage then the amount of injury which will justify the cost of control measure means that um, that uh, uh, damage level, for suppose about 10% of damage, it will uh, leads to some destruct, uh, destruction of the measurable yield. That is called economic damage. Then stone and pedigo, this uh, economic damage, uh, they uh, they defined it in uh, defined it as uh, um, the measurable loss in yield. That is uh, 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 given as gain threshold. That is the amount of uh, kg per hectare, the unit is kg per hectare. That means this much amount of uh, yield, like uh, 10 kg of uh, rice uh, per hectare is the last due to pest attack that they have given as a for, uh, means uh, an, uh, a term for the economic damage for both stone and pedigo. Then uh, the two uh, important uh, concepts of economic, uh, sorry, integrated pest management and the basic uh, concepts of integrated pest management are economic threshold level and economic injury level. The economic threshold level is the pest density at which control measures should be initiated to prevent the pest reaching from EA. EAL. EAL means economic injury level. So economic injury level is the lowest pest density that will cause economic damage means when the pest will uh, will reach the economic damage means we we yeah, we should not take any action that if if we take action also that is very lost to uh, farmer. So economic threshold level is the level where we need to. Uh, act on the pest means we should take the control measures so that we can uh, avoid the economic damage. So Pedigo given the EIL, uh, calculation of EIL, Pedigo given the model that EIL equals to C by V I D K. Okay. C means uh, the cost of control measure and the V is the value of commodity e is the injury uh, equivalence. That means how many insects that one and the da uh, D is the damage uh, per unit injury means uh, 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 one uh, injury equivalent will how much damage the injury equivalent will cause and k is the proportional de uh, uh, decrease in the damage means due to some uh, unfavorable condition for the pest that uh, uh, that leads to some reduction in the damage so this uh, is the model uh, pedigo has given to calculate the economic injury level through economic injury level if we minus the daily reproductive rate of the insect, we will get the economic threshold level. So at the economic threshold level, farmer has to apply the control measures to avoid the economic damage means uh, uh, to avoid the any loss in the crop, we should take the control measure at the economic threshold level. So both these concepts were um, first economic threshold level and economic injury level was given by uh, Stern. Uh, Stern et al. Then this definition of ETL and EAL was given by Pedigo. Okay. So coming to the objectives of IPM is to reduce the pest status to uh, below economic injury level. That means that we are not going to uh, completely reduction of the pest. We are just 
decreasing the pest to economic uh, below the economic uh, injury level so that we can maintain and um, uh, control a uh, balanced ecosystem in the crop environment that leads to even a survival of the predators uh, and parasites in the uh, uh, crop environment okay to manage the insects by not only killing then to use eco friendly methods like uh, cultural methods then mechanical methods which will uh, not a uh, 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 harmful to environment or other uh, non target organisms those methods should, we should concentrate in ipm to make maximum use of natural mortality factors apply control measures only when needed so uh, if uh, we want to apply insecticides we need to uh, take the what is the pest density and uh, at what level we need to apply the pest we need to consider those factors and is this uh, really needed to apply insecticides or we can control with other methods should be considered and those um, uh, factors should be applied for uh, management to um, uh, take this uh, crop uh, production as in a sustainable manner so that decreasing the production cost as well as increasing the benefit to uh, non target organisms and the environment and the uh, welfare of the farmers uh, through integration of all these uh, uh, tactics so uh, 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 all these uh, concepts I have explained will have an interactive session here. Uh, student, uh, please uh, unmute your, uh, who are telling answers, please unmute your um, uh, microphone so that uh, I can hear from you. Uh, so the, who, who given the term integrated pest management, like I have given the four answers, please choose one and reply to me. I'm stunned. Eat all. Uh, no, the term integrated pest management was given by Council on Environmental Quality that I have explained in the last slide. And uh, I'll share this uh, PPT with your sir, and uh, you can distribute and get this one. And uh, uh, second question is the amount of injury that will justify the cost of control measure is. Huh. Economic injury level. Yeah. Economic injury. Uh, okay, sorry. Next answer also came. Uh, the lowest pest density that will cause economic damage is economic injury level. Means uh, uh, if we take control measure also, there will be no uh, use. So another question is the main objective of pest management is Integration of tactics. No. Management of it's pest. It's a management of pest. Yeah, management of pest. Uh, uh, anyway, in the uh, uh, pest management, we'll integrate many uh, tactics, but the management of uh, pest, not, uh, not at all the control. We are managing the pest below the economic injury level is the main objective of this uh, uh, integrated pest management. Okay. So coming to uh, next, uh, we'll discuss on the principles and strategies in integrated pest management. What are the principles we are going to use to tackle the uh, pest uh, uh, population? Uh, first one is monitoring the insect pest and natural enemies. This is important because uh, we need to first know what is the pest density as well as its natural enemies. If we are knowing this uh, pest density and the natural enemies means the proportion of uh, pest and the natural enemy will give a clear cut idea that whether we have to take any control measure on the pest or not. And um, if the natural enemy is not there, then we, we have to take uh, many uh, like other uh, control measures which are uh, uh, suitable for the pest management. Then using the uh, injury level concepts, okay, economic threshold level and uh, economic injury level. So, pest, what is the pest density and at what pest density we need to take the control measure. That is one another important principle. Then integration of pest can control tactics. So, these include both preventive and curative practices and uh, all the components, uh, the, uh, those uh, things I, I am going to explain in the coming slides. Okay. So integration of these tactics, uh, so principles, all principles include 
monitoring of uh, pest and natural enemies, concepts of uh, uh, injury levels and integration of pest control tactics. And uh, one more is that uh, we have to uh, apply a suitable con uh, control measure at the, uh, uh, when pest population reaches economic threshold level. Okay. Then uh, coming to components of integrated pest management, there are uh, different components. Uh, uh, first one is cultural methods, are, uh, which is also called as uh, common uh, agronomic practices, uh, like alternate, alternating the agronomic practices in the uh, field. Okay. Uh, first one is like uh, crop rotation. Right? If, we, if we are growing uh, leguminous crops, then uh, leguminous crops, uh, uh, pest population is different and uh, um, the cereal crop the pest population is different. So legumes uh, crops should be rotated with uh, the cereal crops and uh, uh, other crops which is not suitable for the pest. So crop uh, refuse uh, uh, destruction will reduce the pest population for the next season. And uh, tilling the soil, tillage uh, is uh, most important uh, before taking any crop because it will uh, expose the pupae and uh, other stages of the insect in the soil uh, so that uh, the pest population will decrease in the coming season. The variation in time of planting and harvesting, uh, the like uh, uh, early planting and late planting will uh, decrease the pest population and harvesting is also an important factor like for uh, fruit flies we are uh, timely harvesting before ripening, uh, complete ripening of the fruit. If we harvest the fruit then we can escape the uh, fruit fly attack on the fruits. So uh, other, uh, other things are pruning and thinning like we are uh, practicing in uh, maize uh, against uh, so, uh, maize and uh, sorghum uh, against uh, sorghum shoot fly and the fertilizer management is the most important factors uh, because fertilizers will induce uh, plant resistance to plant. So uh, in uh, integrated uh, fertilizer management is also important. Then water management some um, water stress crops become uh, less uh, resistance and uh, more uh, succulent crops also become uh, uh, more susceptible to pest. So proper water management is important. Then intercropping, uh, like uh, um, intercropping with uh, uh, non-host plants is also important and trap cropping. Uh, the most favorable plants will be planted in the uh, crops, uh, mean like in between the crops after uh, some rows of the crop, crops like that, then we can decrease the pest population. Uh, for example, mar marigold we used to plant in the tomato de decrease, uh, to decrease the helicor power measure. So another concept is a uh, host uh, component is host plant resistance. And uh, this is most uh, important uh, uh, component in uh, integrated pest management because now, by following uh, this uh, 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 resistant, uh, uh, by planting resistant plants, we can uh, certainly decrease the pest population. And this is um, uh, is uh, yielding more benefits uh, than any other methods in uh, uh, pest management, like uh, BT BT cotton we are following. That is also common comes under host plant resistance and. Uh, this uh, there are uh, different concepts like antixanosis, antibiosis, and tolerance. And uh, based on uh, these concepts, uh, the breeders used to breed the plants uh, for the resistance. And uh, these plants uh, will decrease the pest population at the field level. Okay. Then coming to mechanical methods uh, like uh, hand destruction, extinction by screens and barriers, like uh, uh, this uh, manuring. Uh, then uh, the uh, uh, screening the crop, then collection and destruction of different pests and trapping, suction devices, collection, uh, collecting machines, crushing, grinding, and different uh, things are there. So these uh, should be integrated. So physical methods include uh, exposing the grains to heat and uh, uh, cold, like uh, cold storage of grains. The energy, uh, energy uh, uh, which uh, light traps, irradiation, light regulations, this will decrease the pest population. And the sound, for example, for uh, bird scaring, we use uh, calcium carbide uh, and uh, uh, water to, uh, to scare away the birds. So this uh, comes under physical methods. 
coming to biological methods uh, the protection and encouragement of natural enemies will decrease the uh, pest population mm, this uh, especially this biological control is very successful in uh, fruit crops and plantation crops uh, recently in um, uh, this uh, coconut uh, we are controlling uh, the coconut white fly coconuts uh, spiraling white fly where um, is rugo spiraling wild fly are controlling only by biological methods okay so that much effective the biological methods are uh, the introduction and artificial increasing colonizing of the predators and parasitoids uh, will decrease the pest population the pathogens are like virus bacteria fungi protozoa so so development of these uh, different uh, microorganisms uh, against the um, pest and the application of these in the field level will definitely decrease the pest population at the uh, favorable conditions okay use of botanicals like neem pongam and uh, others will uh, going to decrease the decrease the pest population field level uh, those these all uh, will come under biological methods coming to chemical methods uh, which include attractants uh, repellents insecticides and insect growth inhibitors um, the chemosterilants Uh, etc these all components uh, will come under chemical methods some of the behavioral methods which is a uh, important concept again uh, again uh, using of pheromones and allelo chemicals uh, using a pheromone uh, pheromones is uh, is more uh, practiced than uh, allelo chemicals are nowadays pheromones like uh, for uh, for lepidopteran pest we are using pheromones uh, in three different ways which include um monitoring mass trapping and uh, mating destruction i'll explain in the future slides these things and the allelo chemicals are those uh, that are uh, inter specific uh, communication chemicals which are also uh, giving uh, uh, the research is going on on these uh, chemicals and uh, some uh, only in a few pests these are applied uh, at the field levels and uh, in future uh, this may also helps in uh, pest management okay then uh, genetic and biotechnology methods uh, like uh, releasing of genetically incompatible or sterile uh, 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 insects like uh, sterile insect techniques uh, we have seen in uh, uh, cattle uh, screw home uh, management and uh, transgenic plants so for example bt and bt bring uh, bt cotton and bt brinjal uh, like those uh, crops uh, to decrease the pest population then uh, regulatory or legal methods includes uh, the plant quarantine and eradication and suppression programs so means complete uh, uh, eradication of any introduced pest is called eradication and the plant quarantine is uh, at a domestic includes both domestic and international level uh, at the sea ports and uh, airports uh, they exclude uh, if the commodity contains the any insect pest then uh, at uh, uh, sea ports and air, uh, airports those commodity will be rejected and the uh, destruction of that pest will be carried out and uh, this comes under the regulatory or legal methods okay so we'll take a one small interactive session in this uh, so what are the components of ipm uh, uh, the components of ipm which includes are uh cultural control biological control innovative approaches and all of this uh, which is the answer to this one all of this yeah all of this one uh what are the mechanisms of host plant resistance all of these all of the above all of these very good uh plant quarantine comes under in which component of ipm regulatory regulatory yeah yeah uh okay light trap is the component of which uh, control measure physical control mechanical physical mechanical physical yeah. control mechanical uh, yeah, let me let me clarify about this uh, if uh, in your exam uh, anything the trap means uh, any trap except the light trap if it comes means that will come under mechanical and the light trap only light trap will come under physical because uh, here the light is involved okay only light trap will come under physical and all other uh, type of traps will come under mechanical mechanicals okay okay ma'am then we'll move to next concept that uh, innovative approaches that is uh, uh, this is one uh, 
the new uh, component of IPM, which includes semiochemicals, hormones, uh, chemosterilides, genetic control, transgenic crops, attractants, repellents, and antifidants. So these are most um, uh, I mean, uh, environmentally friendly methods uh, which uh, control the pest population. This uh, first uh, we'll discuss about semiochemicals. Uh, so semiochemicals means what? Semiochemicals is uh, the communication chemicals which uh, the any uh, organisms can use. In insects, there are two types. Uh, one is intraspecific communication chemicals that is called uh, pheromones, and uh, interspecific communication chemicals those are called allelochemicals. In pheromones, there are two types of um, uh, pheromones. One is primer and the releaser pheromones. The primer pheromones usually um, um, uh, will not, uh, uh, th these uh, will produce then uh, continuous uh, physiological effects and uh, these will not uh, produce an immediate effect uh, uh, in a receiving organism that uh, include, which includes sexual maturation, development, uh, physiological uh, state, if, uh, like this a chain of events uh, from uh, we, uh, especially this includes uh, the physiological uh, acts on physiological condition of receiving organism for example in a honeybees uh, the queen substance which is uh, example for primer pheromones and the releaser pheromones include sex pheromones aggregation pheromones alarm pheromones trial pheromones epidiotic pheromones and territorial pheromones and different and still many different uh, types of pheromones are there in releaser pheromone types but for your exam point of view this much will be enough uh, so these uh, different pheromones and their uses i'll explain in the coming slides and then coming to allelochemicals uh, the alumone chiromone cinnamon and acnemon is there the alumone is uh, yeah, you might be knowing and i'll uh, explain in the coming slides okay then uh, this uh, using of uh, sex pheromones in pest management. Mm -hmm. So in pest management, we are using sex pheromones in uh, three different uh, concepts. One is monitoring. Monitoring is the uh, most important uh, principles of uh, pest management. So for monitoring the pest population, we are using sex pheromones, uh, which uh, in this uh, the sex pheromones loaded traps we install in the uh, field level like uh, in a less density, like uh, five uh, or 10 uh, per hectare, the traps will be in less concent, uh, so, so in less densities, like five or 10. And uh, based on the uh, catches of the trap, we'll, we are going to monitor the pest population, whether the pest population is below economic threshold level, whether the pest population is above the economic threshold level. So based on this, we can take the pest control uh, decisions. Okay, then uh, mating disruption. Here we will deploy very high concentration of the this pheromone so that we can confuse the uh, uh, male uh, yeah, male insect to uh, find in my finding the males and so that male will fail to locate the female and uh, there will be no mating and uh, further that leads to further reduction of next generation and uh, so uh, egg, uh, the female cannot lay the fertile eggs so that the next generation will be affected so um, then uh, another concept is uh, mass trapping this is most commonly used uh, method uh, in uh, um, uh, using of sex pheromones so mass trapping here uh, a very high density pheromone traps will be installed like 20 to 30 uh, that uh, depends upon the type of pest and the crop okay uh, like high uh, density of these traps will be installed in the uh, 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 this uh, field level so the whatever the uh, insects get attracted and uh, those will be trapped and this is integrated with uh, like uh, you know this uh, attraction and killing and the attraction and infection methods also like uh, attra in attraction and killing this uh, pheromone uh, traps in that uh, some insecticide will be mixed uh, and uh, those attracted insects uh, insects will be killed and in attra uh, attract and uh, uh, lure and uh, so this this is called lure and killing and the uh, another method is lure and infect infect method lure and infect method any uh, this uh, um, uh, pathogens can be infected uh, after attracting the pest. So that will uh, spread the infection to 
other insect pest. So these are the concepts. This is the most important concept which you should know in uh, uh, using of sex pheromones. Okay. Then uh, coming to aggregation pheromones, that uh, sex pheromones uh, till uh, I explained. So, uh, so aggregation pheromones. These aggregation pheromones are usually um, usually produced by the female or male to integrate both the sexes. May, uh, both male and female insects will be attracted towards that. Uh, uh, pheromones and uh, they will gather that may be uh, for mating food or uh, 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 to decrease the host immunity. For example, ferrogenol, this is the most uh, commercially used uh, aggregation pheromones to attract and kill the red palm weevil. Okay, then alarm pheromone, this is uh, uh, the pheromone released by uh, some insects to warn the um, uh, other uh, um, plant specific insects about the presence of the enemy. Okay, so uh, this uh, concept is most uh, useful in uh, aphids management. The aphids uh, will release E beta furnacin when uh, uh, when they'll sense the presence of the enemy, they will release E beta furnacin. So this uh, is commercially synthesized and uh, sprayed uh, on the crop leads to. Uh, the destruction uh, means a uh, distraction of uh, aphids and uh, they will fall down and die. So this is uh, used usually in potato crops to, to manage the aphid pest. Then uh, coming to trial pheromones. So the trial pheromones usually volatile compounds released by some social insects to find the uh, mates and the find the food uh, sources. Okay. Uh, this uh, mostly uh, used in uh, management of ants and termites. The also, this uh, trial pheromones uh, will be integrated with the insecticides and used to manage the ants and termites. So another uh, important one is epidiotic pheromone. This is most uh, uh, peculiar one, which will epidiotic pheromones is uh, mostly known from uh, this uh, fruit flies and uh, the uh, the epidiotic pheromones means. This uh, fruit flies when they'll release uh, when after uh, egg laying they'll release the that uh, pheromone so that no other uh, fruit fly should lay the egg nearby that. This is the concept they use to maintain the population density and get uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, because uh, because of this their progeny will get the sufficient food. But this can be used in pest management by. Uh, we, uh, we can just uh, spraying, uh, commercially synthesize this uh, epidiotic pheromone and spraying on the crop leads to, so no other fruit fly will uh, come and attack the uh, uh, fruits, okay? So another one is uh, territorial pheromone. So though, though this one is not uh, that much commercially important, this territorial pheromone is usually uh, released by the bumblebees and carpenter bees uh, while foraging and uh, in nest making. Then use of allelochemicals in pest management. Uh, first, we will know what is alumone, chiromone, cinnamon, and natimone. Alumones are the chemicals which released by um, any organism, which is beneficial to release it, but not to the receiving organism. And these allelochemicals I have already explained. These are, <coughs> sorry for that. These are interspecific means uh, this is not a, uh, a receiving organism will not be the same species, okay? This will be a different species receiving organism here. So beneficial to releaser, but not to the receiver. Uh, because this will, allelochemicals will uh, uh, usually harm the receiving organism. So one of the example is uh, in, uh, so using of this allelochemicals in pest management is uh, apple maggot fly. So repelling, uh, to um, uh, this one, uh, apple maggot play, they are using alomones. Okay, chiromone is beneficial to receiver, and uh, this uh, chiromones are used in uh, management of cattle screwworm flies. Then, uh, cinnamon beneficial to both emitter and uh, receiver. This is uh, like the beta caryophyllini uh, released by the cotton plants to attract uh, green lace weaving. The, so this um, chemical will be commercially synthesized and uh, sprayed on the cotton crops to attract uh, to attract and augment the green lace wings in the uh, cotton crop to manage the sucking pests. 
then apnemones are released by non living material favorable to receiver but detrimental to organism which is living in that this is uh, for example uh, an ichneumonid uh, parasite will identify um, the host based on the uh, um, oatmeal uh, smell of uh, its uh, um, uh, uh, host okay the apnemone uh, this is uh, not much importance in pest management then uh, we'll take on a, a small interactive session uh, coming to questions and the allelochemicals are used for which type of communications interspecific yeah interspecific and the intraspecific communication chem uh, uh, chemicals are called pheromones okay then uh, which is the first uh, pheromone isolated from which insect silkworm silkworm the pheromone is called the first sex pheromone is called bombi call you know that ah yes ma'am okay uh, then uh, who given the term uh, a pheromone carlson and lester yeah carlson and lester in 1959 that uh, the first uh, identified okay ferrogenol is which type of pheromone aggregation aggregation yeah aggregation aggregation pheromone yeah uh, can anybody name any trial pheromone trial pheromone formic acid formic acid and no 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 formic acid is uh, alarm pheromone uh, heptanoic acid hexanoic acid that is uh, trial pheromones which which one ma'am uh, heptanoic and hexanoic acids okay ma'am okay you you can find that in uh, um, tv prasad book okay just uh, give and read because this uh, trial pheromone uh, uh, heptanoic and hexanoic acid is came in uh, last to uh, 2021 uh, this um, ARS prelims exam okay okay ma'am okay. then we'll go to next slide uh, hormones are insect growth regulators used in uh, pest management is, uh, is another component in uh, pest management like the uh, hormones will be released by insects uh, which uh, which are internal uh, com uh, communication chemicals released by insects to regulate their growth and development so uh, in pest management we are using these uh, hormones uh, for managing the pest population this includes juvenile hormones anti juvenile hormones egg diazone and uh, uh, the um, uh, sino um, means uh, synthetic uh, chemicals of egg diazone are called egg, egg diazone steroids and the uh, chitin synthesis inhibitors coming to hormonal control in insect metamorphosis is uh, when uh, uh, when the pest is in a juvenile condition the juvenile hormone will be in more concentration and uh, when it uh, going to mold the uh, egg diazone will be, uh, uh, egg diazone hormone will be more concentration so for molding egg diazone is needed and uh, for maintaining juvenile uh, condition juvenile hormone is needed the juvenile hormone released by carpus uh, carpus allatum and uh, uh, this uh, egg diazone hormone released by prothoracic glands okay so uh, based by using this uh, mechanism so we are altering the uh, pest growth so that Uh, by this we can manage the pest is the main concept in um, managing this pest so juvenile hormone uh, the synthetic anal analog of uh, juvenile is called juvenile sorry right okay uh, juvenile synthetic analog of uh, juvenile hormone is called juvenides and uh, uh, first uh, this um, juvenile hormone uh, role uh, in uh, insects uh, was given by wiggles work that uh, juvenile hormone inhibit metamorphosis and stimulate ovarian development that means juvenile hormone is important in uh, in adult insects to um, stimulate the ovarian development okay 
then uh, jh uh, can be used so this general hormone can be used in uh, pest management as an insecticide was uh, the idea was first given by williams in 1956 then in 1966 similarly the uh, williams and uh, slam and williams they discovered paper factor the, that is uh, from the tree abies balsamia so this paper factor uh, um, is having the characters of juvenal hormone so that uh when we apply the uh, this juvenile uh, hormone to insects this uh, the, the immature insects will remain as immature and uh, there will be no reproductive development in the insects so that um, we can uh, reduce the future uh, generations of the pest this is the concept of they they are used uh, for juvenile hormone analogs uh, in pest management so effect of using juvenile leaves to fail in molt and fail to reach the adult stage the com- most commercially used juvenile hormones are methoprene phenoxycarb and pyrethroxyphen so this is important in uh, in view of your examination point that juvenile hormone analogs we used in pest management they will give options like this okay so you should know, know these chemicals uh, properly then uh, anti juvenile hormones is uh, usually uh, the juvenile hormone mainly produced by carpora alata so by inhibiting carpora alata we are going to uh, re- um, uh, inhibit the juvenile hormone production so when uh, there is no juvenile hormone production the uh, adult uh, growth will be precocious metamorphosis means there will be no uh, proper uh, development of the adult and uh, so that no reproduction uh, leads to decrease in the next generation population the first uh, anti juvenile hormone is called procosins and this was isolated from um, uh, plant uh, called ageratum conozoides uh, this is also important procosins are anti juvenile hormones this uh, procosins are two types of procosins 1 and 2 and those are uh, uh, isolated from ageratum conozoides uh, this uh, will be asked again in the exams the procosins are very important you should know that then uh, molting hormone uh, includes uh, egg di- uh, the molting hormone is uh, egg dyson and the synthetic analog of uh, egg dyson is called egg dye steroids so carlson and butendert in 1954 first isolated this egg dyson uh, egg dyson from silkworm larvae then this uh, application of this egg dye steroids leads to hyper egg dysonism uh, symptoms in the Uh, any insect that is inhibiting the dna synthesis in the epidermal cells so there will be no proper molting of uh, uh, in the insect leads to uh, uh, death of the insects the commercially used uh, egg dyes are tebuphenazide halofenazide methoxyphenazide this tebu halofenazide methoxyphenazide you should uh, remember this uh, because they will ask again uh, this one in the examination okay then coming to chitin synthesis inhibitor the chitin synthesis in uh, enzyme this uh, uh, inhibit the uh, uh, chitin synthetase enzymes this uh, usually applied at the larval stages uh, so it act as a larvicide the this um, enzyme will block the chitin synthesis that means there so that uh, while molting there will be no proper uh, synthesis of the chitin and the, the newly formed uh, cuticle will be of uh, deformed or uh, most uh, uh, susceptible uh, for uh, environmental conditions and no proper uh, uh, um, uh, this uh, chitin formation leads to death of the insects so commercially used one are diflubenzurone teflubenzurone uh, triflubenzurone etc where is zuron uh, will uh, where zuron uh, will come the, that is called uh, chitin synthesis inhibitor so these are again used in pest management coming to chemosterilants so what are uh, chemosterilants chemosterilants uh, usually red, uh, reproductive inhibitors uh, that uh, deprive any insect uh, from uh, reproducing okay and the first and foremost uh, concept was uh, given by nipling in 1937 that is uh, called uh, uh sterile insect techniques using the, the chemosterilants um, chemosterilants may be the chemical or the irradiations okay here uh, in sterile insect techniques uh, they used uh, uh, gamma irradiation from uh, cobalt 60 to uh, 
to uh, manage uh, cattle school worm flies. Uh, this uh, for this uh, nippling the uh, awarded World Food Prize uh, um, in, uh, uh, in maybe uh, in uh, 1995. Okay, just uh, check the year. So nippling the uh, uh, awarded World Food Prize for is this uh, sterile insect techniques. Again, this is very important uh, point in 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 view of your examination point. Okay. This, uh, then uh, coming to another uh, concept uh, nowadays most uh, popular is uh, using of transgenic crops. <coughs> Sorry. So transgenic crops, uh, the most uh, common is uh, in uh, India only BT cotton. Uh, in transgenic crops, uh, the uh, in uh, in BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, is a uh, soil inhabiting bacteria which will produce uh, crystal proteins, which are uh, insecticidal crystal proteins. Those uh, character will be included in the plant uh, through genetic engineering techniques. And uh, these plants uh, uh, will uh, produce the toxin inside, inside the plant so that the, when the insect feed on the plants, the insect going to die. Um, uh, insect going to die. This is the concept uh, they are using in uh, transgenic crops. So first commercialized uh, transgenic crop in India is BT cotton and the only uh, transgenic crop still grown in India is uh, BT cotton, okay? The BT brinjal is a to be uh, commercialized, but uh, this is, uh, that is not it uh, uh, commercialized because uh, some bio uh, bio this uh, biosafety data trials are going on on BT Brinjal. So for now, only BT cotton is uh, commercially grown in India. Coming to uh, antifidants, uh, the antifidants usually inhibit uh, olfactory receptors, means uh, which, uh, which will uh, reduce the pest damage on the uh, crop by inhibiting the olfactory receptors so that uh, pest fail to feed on the treated crops. Then attractants uh, oriented movement, uh, attractants will cause uh, an oriented movements of the pest towards the any source. So, so uh, uh, for, the, for example, pheromones we can use as attractants and uh, aggregation pheromones we can use as attractants like that um, the uh, uh, plant produced chiromones we can use as attractants. Like that many uh, things we can use as attractants and uh, uh, can trap insects and kill them. Then uh, repellents, uh, this uh, cause oriented movement away from the uh, from the source so means a treated plant will repel the insects uh, uh, through these uh, repellent properties so um, many factors like allomones can be used to for uh, repelling uh, uh, like a plant produced allomones especially can be used in uh, used uh, for repelling the pest population so these uh, antifidants, attractants, and repellents, these concepts mainly are used in push-pull strategy. Uh, push-pull strategy, uh, anybody might be knowing that uh, push-pull strategy, we integrate the different uh, stimuli, that is uh, plant-produced stimuli and the insect-produced stimuli to uh, avoid the pest damage on the crop. Uh, so uh, in that, uh, these antifidants and attractants and repellents will be more used. Uh, coming to uh, another interactive session, uh, the paper, paper factor discovered by students. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paper factor discovered by. Slamayan Williams. Yeah, can you please uh, tell me the year? Uh, okay, 1956, uh, uh, Slamayan Williams discovered the paper factor, and uh, sorry, 1966, uh, Slam and Williams discovered the paper factor. And in 1956, Williams told that uh, this juvenile hormones can be used uh, as an insecticide. Okay, sterile male technique proposed by? 
anybody first chitin synthesis inhibitor pebu prem bhai uh, no actually pebu prem is an uh, egg dye steroid the dimilin the diflubenzone uh, brand name is dimilin okay diflubenzone is first chitin synthesis inhibitor and pebu uh, phenazide is egg dye steroid again and the proposin is ఎంటీ <laughs> Uh, these names because the same questions will come like methoprenes and uh, proposenes like that only will come so should be very thorough with that you, ju- you just uh, mug up those uh, names uh, okay then uh, antixenosis word given by though i have not mentioned kogan and ortman ortman very good okay um, okay guys uh, this was uh, about uh, the integrated pest management uh, i want to brief uh, brief you uh, uh, what are the important points uh, uh, especially in view of jrf srf or the uh, uh, ars point of view um, I, i think uh, most of you who are preparing for uh, jrf exam and uh, i think uh, this lecture will be more useful for you people and uh, yeah more than that you might be uh, now uh, you might be knowing with this lecture that what are the um, things we should concentrate uh, in view of examination point okay in the integrated pest management so i will be sharing this uh, ppt with your uh, sir uh, so that uh, he can circulate with you and uh, you can read and uh, uh, read uh, some objective type of uh, books so that we will you will be well aware with uh, the type of questions they will be asking in the jrf examination so this is all about integrated pest management hello sir hi uh, yes ma'am uh yes sir is uh, that was uh, clear sir uh yes uh, you you may start uh, the second session yeah so we'll continue the sericulture lecture uh, yes ma'am yes our uh, five ten minutes break for the students or anyway uh, whatever you tell i think uh no madam usually we mm, take uh, both the classes in continuation okay sir so thank you been... okay so thanks sir uh, okay uh, everyone uh, now uh, we will look at uh, another important uh, concept which is important for uh, your jrf exam that is uh, sericulture okay uh, sericulture is a uh, very uh, important concept in uh, jrf srf and uh, ars exam in jrf about uh, uh, four to six questions will come uh, from sericulture itself so this is very simple topic and uh, you will get uh, more marks uh, by studying the, this topic and uh, for srf also there will be questions and uh, for ars also there will be definitely 
uh, five marks, uh, uh, one or two questions uh, from five marks and uh, two to three questions from two marks uh, questions will be there. So sericulture is uh, an important uh, concept uh, for uh, uh, studying. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, what is sericulture? Uh, sericulture is rearing of the silicones for a commercial production of the silk. Then uh, what is silk? Silk is uh, the natural protein fiber produced by the silicones. The different silicones produce a uh, protein fiber which is commercially used in um, uh, for uh, this uh, making of uh, different uh, fabrics uh, like uh, silk, uh, silk fabrics which is used in making different uh, clothings. So this uh, material, um, the protein fiber which is called as silk. Coming to history of silk, uh, we uh, has our uh, uh, Indian history. There are mentions about uh, silk in Ramayana and Mahabharata, and uh, there is an early record of that uh, Indian king, uh, sorry, Persian, uh, Pers Indian king sent uh, silk items to Persian king in uh, 3000. 870 BC. This is one earlier like a record about our silk, and uh, there are mentions uh, about the silk in Yojana Valley. So these are uh, uh, Indian history about the silk, but the uh, most uh, recorded are uh, this um, considered uh, about the discovery of the silk is that uh, the uh, Empress. The Empress of K. Wangchi, uh, the name is Lord Chu. She is the Empress of K. Wangchi. She discovered uh, silk. Uh, there is one small story about the discovery of the silk. That, uh, Lord Chu is an Empress. So she was uh, one evening, she was sitting in her gar uh, garden and uh, having the cup of tea. When she held uh, her uh, a cup of tea, uh, one uh, cocoon like material has fallen into her tea and uh, when she is trying to remove that, some uh, thread like material came. So that is where the point that uh, the silk uh, uh, came into existence. Uh, from there, the Chinese have commercialized uh, the uh, silk production and uh, they, they, are, they are the first one to domesticate the silk <coughs> Then about uh, 2000 years, uh, they have not shared this secret of this uh, um, fantastic uh, fabric or uh, the protein uh, fiber, fiber material with uh, any of the countries. And um, in uh, 555 AD, European monks went to China. From, uh, from there, um, they, uh, they came to know that this uh, silicon material is there. From, uh, from there, they, they have still some uh, 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 silk worm eggs, uh, so uh, so that uh, from there, uh, from European countries, it has uh, spread to all over the world. This is about the story of the silk, uh, discovery of the silk and uh, how it is uh, spread to other countries. Coming to uh, now its uh, production, uh, the China is in uh, first position, it's uh, producing about 58% uh, of the uh, silk in the world and uh, India is in uh, second position which is about 14 percent of the silk uh, produced in the world and uh, India is uh, the largest consumer too and uh, we are both uh, we are in both first position both means um, uh, first position in uh, consumer of the silk and the second position in producers of the silk so there is very uh, vast demand uh, for production of the silk in India so okay uh, in uh, Indian states, uh, Karnataka is uh, uh, first uh, in production of the silk, about 90% of the silk is produced from Karnataka and the uh, share following Andhra Pradesh, uh, Assam and uh, different uh, states. And about 90% uh, of the mulberry silk, uh, uh, means the 90% of the silk uh, includes the mulberry silk. Um, and then uh, about 10% include the non-mulberry silk, which uh, is 6% is about airy and the tassar is 1.4% and the muga is 0.5%. Okay, this is, uh, is the current data about the uh, production. Coming to uh, silicon uh, species and, and their characteristics, uh, the first and most commercialized and domesticated uh, silicon is mulberry silicon. Uh, the scientific name is Mombaxi Mori. 
and the host plants is uh, mainly this vamoxymore is monophagous which uh, that means within a genus many species it will feed and it means only morus genus uh, plants uh, is only fed by this uh, mulberry silicon the host plants include morus alba morus indica like that in some other morus uh, species and the characteristics includes uh, four different stages egg larva pupa and adult as yes, uh, this is an lepidopter insect the egg diapause uh, uh, yeah, will go about uh, nine days and this is multi old time uh, silicomes uni old time silicomes and by old time silicomes all the um, three types of oltinism will be ex expressed by this mulberry silicon and uh, different uh, regions and uh, based on the environmental conditions the oltinism will vary the egg diapers uh, uh, will be there in bombaximori and the larva will uh, will be about 30 to 30 uh, two days and about five instars and four molds and the pupa will be for about nine days and the adult is uh, lives for five, five to six days then whole life cycle will uh, complete in 45 to 60 days coming to its uh, cocoon cocoon will be uh, many uh, colors like white cream or greenish yellow these uh, colors you should know white cream or greenish yellow is the mulberry silicon cocoon and um, these uh, 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 cocoons uh, will be uh, giving the silk thread of about 650 to 1300 meters. That uh, univalent times uh, usually give better quality and uh, long uh, th uh, threads uh, uh, about 1300 and 650 will be the multi old time silk cocoons. Okay, what is uh, multi old times means about uh, five to six. Uh, crops in a year can be taken in multi old time uh, breeds and uh, bio old times will be only two uh, crops will be taken in bio old times and uni old time will be uh, only one crop will be taken in a year so uni old times will be usually the kashmiri breeds and uh, bio old times uh, is uh, usually japan breeds and the multi old times usually south indian breeds are that uh, that, will, that will be grown in mysore um, and uh, Mysuru and uh, different parts of Karnataka and uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Tamil Nadu states. Okay, the major states in India which is growing the mulberry silicone is Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and parts of Tamil Nadu. So the rearing techniques of this uh, include uh, uh, two, one is uh, the early age uh, rearing that is one to uh, completion of the second mold is called Chaki rearing and the uh, Third instar to fifth instar rearing is called uh, latest silkworm rearing. Okay, these uh, two uh, points are important. What is chaki rearing means? Rearing of the silkworms up to completion of the second mold. That means two instars. Uh, after completion of the second mold, when it uh, entered third instar, uh, till that time we are calling as chaki rearing. And the chaki rearing will be done in the trace. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the trace usually used for uh, chaki rearing. And um, latest silicone rating um, will be uh, like uh, different types of uh, latest silicone rating. That is, uh, third, fourth, and fifth instar silicones will be uh, reared uh, by the farmers in uh, different methods. Some farmers use a shelf method, as you can see here. That is a shelf method and um, uh, floor method, and the, uh, this uh, bamboo tray method. Bamboo trays will be arranged in. Uh, in a shelf uh, about uh, 10 to 12 uh, in a single uh, row and uh, those will, uh, the only uh, chopped leaves will be fed to the uh, silicones. In a shelf method, uh, all, uh, all uh, stems of the mulberry plants will be provided as you can see here. Uh, this uh, will be uh, less uh, uh, labor intensive and uh, will be more uh, mm, uh, yes, uh, giving more uh, mm, uh, area for uh, development of the silicones than in a uh, tray method and uh, less laborious to workers uh, as well. Okay, in, the, in floor method, uh, uh, usually uh, uh, like uh, in uh, 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 steps methods like that only in floor method about a meter uh, width and uh, the length of the uh, raiding bed will be as long as the raiding house and uh, those will be raided on the floor and the 
for uh, floor method, there will be more spaces required and the bed cleaning and those uh, things will be difficult. So usually farmers will be going for shelf rearing only. For uh, chalky rearing, the tray rearing will be done and the, for latest silicone rearing, shelf rearing will be done. And uh, for shelf rearing, for uh, chalky rearing, only chopper leaves will be used and uh, for uh, shelf rearing, um, uh, the whole stem um, along with the leaves will be fed to the silicones and uh, in shelf method, uh, the bed cleaning will be by net method or uh, using, using the stems of uh, this, um, using the mulberry leaves which are fed and uh, the old uh, uh, leftover uh, um, uh, fecal material will be removed uh, for, a, um, for uh, once uh, for each motor. Okay, this is about uh, the mulberry rearing. Coming to mulberry life cycle, uh, the egg is already told that uh, about nine days it will take to hatch. When uh, after hatching, the the um, mulberry silkworms will be pressured to fresh leaves of the mulberry leaves, and uh, egg larvae will take uh, about ten days. That is, the chaki rearing will take uh, about uh, ten days, and the latest worms, uh, third, fourth, and fifth instar, uh, take about uh, fourteen days. When the when the um, uh, Worms will turn uh, like a light yellow. They will be mounted on the different montages, like uh, um, different montages include uh, Chandrika, the rotary montage, plastic montages, uh, like that. And uh, those uh, after uh, mounting uh, for about uh, after uh, six days, those will be, cocoons will be collected and uh, they they can be marketed. Okay, and sixth uh, after six day they will be. Uh, collected from the mountages and uh, sent to the market. And once uh, once uh, they will send to market, from there uh, they will go to drainages or for uh, reeling. Both, um, both if they will go to drainages, uh, the moth will be means uh, the cocoons will be preserved uh, preserved so that moth will emerge in ten to twelve days and uh, mating will take place. And in drainages, uh, the disease free egg layings will be. Uh, done that is uh, a, a DF, that is called DFLs and the DFL include about 400 to 450 egg. This is important point. Uh, uh, you should not turn this. Uh, DFL includes uh, 400 to 450 eggs. Uh, for a reeling, uh, they will be taken. If they will be taken for the reeling, then they will be uh, uh, stiffened. Means uh, the cocoon will be killed inside. So that uh, it should not pierce the moth, should not pierce the uh, cocoon, and uh, the continuous the thread can be reeled from the cocoons. Okay, so this is uh, about the mulberry silkworm. Coming to um, another uh, silkworm uh, is called uh, airy silk, which is uh, also called as ahimsa silk, endi silk, erendi silk, and the spun silk. These names are very important, uh, you should know. Ahimsa, ND, RND, and spun silk. In any of this name means uh, that is a uh, airy silk because uh, the Ahimsa silk, why it is called means in all the uh, silkworms uh, for uh, reeling, uh, means uh, for uh, taking the silk thread, we are killing the silkworms in the means uh, while they are in the pupal stage, we are killing the silkworm inside the uh, cocoon itself by stifling the cocoon to get uh, continuous threads but in uh, eri uh, uh, silk uh, the cocoon uh, what will uh, the in the cocoon the silk thread will not be continuous uh, thread so anyway uh, the the thread is already cut uh, while making itself so the moth is uh, we are leaving the moth to emerge and uh, the cocoons are taken for um, reeling so that uh, that that's why it is called as ahimsa silk so here we are no, not going to kill the moths that's why it is called ahimsa silk and then uh, different uh, nd and rnd silks will be, uh, will be based on uh, different regions so they have come and uh, spun silk uh, because this is um, this is not uh, continuously uh, reeled the, uh, it is spun that's why it is uh, because the uh, silk is not continuous, so it is. It will be spun. It is not reeling. That's why it is called spun silk. Okay, airy silkworm. Uh, the name is Samia cynthia resini, and all the silkworm scientific name is very important. You should know the scientific names of uh, them. Okay, Samia cynthia resini, and um, the host plants include castor and caseru. Mostly castor will be used. Uh, 
these are uh, uh, although it is it also feeds on secondary host plants the most early used uh, for better quality of the seed is uh, castor and casseru castor is easily grown and uh, can be uh, yeah, grown in any land that's why uh, castor will be preferred for rearing this uh, silkworm the characteristics of this silkworm is include uh, multi voltine and semi domesticated the larva will take about uh, 17 to 25 days to uh, uh, complete its development and the cocoons are open end cocoons that's why it is called uh, spun silk and the silk uh, color is white or brick red in color and the states uh, which uh, uh, usually uh, rearing this uh, eri silk uh, silkworms are north eastern states bihar orissa and west bengal now again this is an important point should not be the rearing of this uh, silkworm uh, usually uh, uh, domestic uh, rearing and the two types uh, types of rearing is there uh, is there first one to uh, third instar they will uh, rear in uh, tray rearing means uh, they will uh, rear in uh, trays and uh, fourth and fifth instar they will be uh, bunch rearing this is important bunch rearing means here you can see in the picture the castor leaves will be uh, tied to a bamboo uh, uh, stick um, horizontally placed bamboo stick so that on the castor leaves then uh, the castor leaves uh, uh, put as a uh, this uh, bunch and on that the eri silkworms will be uh, uh, left so that uh, the eri silkworms will feed on the castor leaves and the excreta will be fallen on the ground so this method will be used for latest silkworms in a eri silkworm that is fourth and fifth instar so this is uh, about uh, rearing of uh, this eri uh, silk and um, uh, method of reeling will be uh, uh, by hand itself uh, through uh, uh, sp uh, spinning uh, that is uh, that's why it is called as spun silk coming to another important uh, silk uh, is uh, tussar silk this is uh, called uh, tropical uh, tussar uh, and uh, there are two types so one is uh, tropical tussar and the another one is temperate tussar the tropical tussar is called antheria milita and uh, uh, you can see in this picture this is antheria milita and the host plants include uh, asan and arjun the mainly uh, asan is called uh, terminalia tomentosa and arjun is called terminalia arjuna these are mostly uh, mainly used uh, host plants for this and uh, sal and bara can be also used and uh, the characteristics of this uh, silkworms include that uh, these are uni or bivoltine silkworms and the larva will take about um, uh, the uni voltine uni voltine means uh, only one crop for a year that will be in uh, temperate regions and the bivoltine will be uh, two crops a year that is uh, usually from august to october one crop from october to december one crop so and the main characteristic of this uh, tassa silkworm is that uh all the silkworms will uh, the mulberry silkworms will go for a diapausing uh, egg stage but the tussar silkworm will go for diapausing pupal stage okay after completion of uh, uh, unual time means august to october crop or uh, october to december crop the pupa will go into diapause and will emerge in the next season means in the next august are uh, in the next october okay that is uh, that is the diapausing stage the pupa is the diapausing stage in tussar silkworm La the larva uh, lives about the uh, complete uh, complete its development in 35 to 70 days uh, means the longest period uh, in the 35 means in the tropical conditions and the 70 days be in the um, uh, this uh, temperate conditions i mean when is the um, Uh, environment is cold that time it will take uh, around 70 days the cocoon uh, cocoon the silk color will be copperish in color and the uh, uh, particular uh, character of this uh, cocoon sir uh, cocoon sir about uh, the big cocoons that means they will be uh, about uh, the egg size and the, they are having peduncle uh, the peduncle will be helps in hanging the cocoons uh, from the tree sir Uh, this is one peculiar character about the tussar silk and the different states uh, in india producing uh, the tussar silk include manipur meghalaya assam orissa and up 
the rating of this uh, tassar uh, silk uh, include um, this is uh, usually um, not uh, domesticated because it cannot be domesticated like uh, they uh, they won't mate in captivity that's why they, they they cannot be domesticated okay and uh, they won't construct the cocoons uh, in uh, in captivity that's why uh, two factors why they are not uh, domesticated means they, um, the silkworms will not construct the cocoons in uh, captivity and uh, another one is uh, the moths will not mate in, in captivity that's why they will not be domesticated these are the reasons for uh, not domesticating these silkworms and um, the rearing includes uh, the cocoons will be procured and uh, allowed for mating once uh, uh, after uh, 24 hours of mating the females will be tied to uh, uh, moni uh, in a means uh, palm leaves uh, made a small uh, pot like uh, thing in that uh, the female moth will be really uh, for egg laying or uh, the, the, they will be uh, they also used cardboards to for egg laying of tassar moths so after egg laying uh, and these eggs will be uh, uh, allowed for uh, hatching and after hatching they will be brushed on the host trees the host trees uh, they will be maintained uh, in a uh, small plantation uh, like thing or they in uh, like in traditional uh, uh, rearing they they will be uh, in, uh, in the forest uh, like uh, terminally arjuna terminally tropitosa these uh, trees will be in the forest and the tribal people will use to use that uh, plants uh, for rearing this uh, tassar silk and uh, the, after hatching the silk worm, uh, tassar silk worm uh, will be pressed on the host plants. After uh, they will complete, uh, uh, tassar silk worm complete its larval uh, development on the host tree itself and construct the cocoons in the host tree itself by hanging, the, uh, hanging their cocoons uh, through the pedicles to uh, 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 different branches in the tree. Okay, those cocoons will be collected by the uh, farmers later. So this is uh, the rearing techniques uh, about the tassar silk. And uh, coming to temperate tassar. Temperate tassar is uh, called anterior proili, anterior roili, and anterior parna. The uh, different uh, regions, uh, they will be called different uh, species. And the temperate tassar um, feeds on uh, oak tassar, uh, means uh, it's also called as oak tassar. This uh, feed on oak plants, that is Percus species. This is important again. What is oak tassar means? Oak tassar is uh, temperate tassar, which uh, feed on oak plants, Percus species. And uh, this, uh, in India, this uh, can be uh, found in sub Himalayan fields. But uh, the main difference between uh, tropical tassar and temperate tassar is that uh, all the characters are same, but the um, silk quality of this uh, temperate tassar will be smoother than the uh, tropical tassar. This is the main difference between uh, temperate and tropical tassar uh, silk worms. Okay. The rearing techniques will be again the same for uh, both uh, temperate and tropical tassar silk worms. Coming to uh, another most important uh, silk worm species, this is uh, commercially uh, grown is. Muga silkworm, the Antheria assamensis. The host plants will include uh, the Som uh, and Sol. Som will be Persia bombicina and uh, Sol will be Litsia polyantha. The Som also called as uh, uh, Persi, uh, Persia uh, bombicina. And uh, both uh, these uh, host plants are used uh, for uh, rearing of these silkworms. The uh, main characteristic of Muga silk is. <coughs> Sorry, uh, Mugasil got the GA tag uh, in, uh, for uh, uh, for Assam. This uh, uh, Mugasil is only grown in India. That's why this is monopoly to India, and it's also got the GA tag, and it is only grown in Assam state. The characteristics include this is multi voltain and uh, we can take about five to six crops in a year, and the color of the cocoon will be golden color cocoons and this is most costliest silk uh, in the world okay the silk fabric will be more costlier uh, because of its luster and long lasting the um, uh, characteristic of the silk and its uh, color coming to its uh, life cycle of the muga silk is uh, it's uh, uh, 
include egg uh, larva and pupal uh, and adult stages the both male and female will mate and lay the eggs the different instar silkworms you can see here and uh, different uh, 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 times of uh, means a different duration of uh, uh, the, the different stages of the muga silkworm include the egg will be about uh, seven days and the first uh, first stage silkworm will be completed in three to six days and the second stage silkworm is about uh, three to five days and the third uh, instar silkworm takes about four to eight days and the fourth instar silkworm about takes about uh, five to eleven days uh, the period on this much variance is because of some uh, in winters and the summers the larval period will be different and the fifth instar uh, silkworm will take about uh, 7 to 15 days. So this is the most uh, longest period. And um, they, uh, the after fifth instar, uh, completion of fifth instar, they'll search for uh, uh, mounting sp uh, uh, space. That's why uh, they will travel down to base of the plant from where they will be collected and mounted on jollies. And uh, these cocoons will uh, take uh, about three to seven uh, seven days uh, to emerge, and uh, after emergence in the month, again the uh, emergence of the month, they will be used for egg laying, or the cocoons will be used for reeling. This um, uh, you know, the rearing techniques of this uh, silkworms include the after collecting the. Uh, cocoons, the cocoons will be separated, uh, both male and uh, female cocoons will be separated. Here we can see the cocoons, uh, the bigger cocoons will be the females and the smaller cocoons will be the males. After emergence of uh, this uh, um, male and females, they are allowed for mating. After 24 hours, they will be tied to karika. Here you can see in the pictures, the karika means uh, the um, uh, wooden uh, sticks uh, made from uh, 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 from a particular plant and uh, those uh, we, you, uh, those are uh, tied to uh, uh, stick, uh, those are uh, uh, compiled as a stick and uh, this is used for egg laying of um, muga silkworms and uh, this karika word is very important and karika is used for egg laying of the muga silkworms and after egg laying um, uh, af after egg laying they will be allowed for uh, hatching of the eggs. When the when the eggs will hatch, the caricas will be collected and they will be mounted. Uh, they will be tied to host trees uh, from where the the uh, hatched silkworms will travel up the tree. Um, uh, tree are the host plant, and uh, they will uh, start feeding. Once uh, they will start feeding, if the host plant is emptied, then they will be collected using this triangular um, pads and. Uh, these uh, will be carried, uh, this will be having the long stick to hold. These will be carried to other uh, host plants and will be mounted on another host plant if the, uh, the leaves are empty. Then uh, after uh, completion of the fifth instar, the, the uh, silkworm will travel down the tree, uh, usually in the evening hours. Those will be collected by the farmers. Uh, this, uh, that's why this farming is uh, become risky because uh, we, uh, uh, the, the ripen worms will be collected in the evening hours and it may last uh, up to night. So uh, collecting these worms in the uh, night uh, in that um, different forest area will be difficult. That's why uh, this is endangering, in fact, uh, um, uh, endangering uh, rearing uh, in uh, Assam and uh, this has become uh, so costly, uh, the silk is also. Okay. After collecting these uh, silkworms, they will be mounted on different mountages. The traditional one is, is called jali. Jali is uh, the, um, uh, this uh, dried banana or uh, uh, jackfruit leaves will be um, woven like uh, this uh, uh, round uh, uh, ball like and uh, on that uh, the silkworms will be released for cocoon construction and it will take about seven to eight days for this uh, cocoon construction. After this, they will be collect, uh, the cocoons will be collected and they can be taken for reeling or can be used for, uh, again, for uh, egg production by the grain ages. Uh, so that uh, that was uh, about the rearing of the mukasilpum. 
coming to reeling of moga silkam is a traditional reeling machine is called bir and the advanced uh, uh, reeling machine called multi held reeling machine is used for moga silkam reeling the csr and ti uh, 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 and uh, csb is trained so level best to improve these uh, non mulberry silkam reeling techniques and uh, uh, reeling techniques in different uh, uh, silkams okay then uh, coming to diseases of the silkworms the mainly uh, four uh, different uh, diseases are identified in the silkworms that is uh, coming to protozoan disease uh, is called febrile disease the causal organism is nosema bombesis this uh, nosema bombesis uh, attack all the stages of the uh, silkworms including egg larva pupa and the adult and it is transovarial that means uh, it it uh, the disease will be transferred from mother to uh, uh, young ones through uh, eggs that is called transovarial so uh, through uh, uh, to tackle this mother moth examination mother moth examination will be conducted to identify the febrile disease and uh, through this uh, when they when they find any um, in fact uh, infectious uh, material in the eggs then the whole lot will be rejected by the drainage people okay that's why mother moth examination is very important for detection of protozoan disease and its control the uh, main symptom of this disease include uh, paper like spots as you can see in the pictures the paper like spots on the silkworms and the silkworm become less active and uh, lethargic and uh, stop feeding uh, in the adult uh, silkworms uh, the deformed wings and uh, and uh, the adult silkworm will lay and fertile eggs uh, will be the symptoms in adult and the uh, ununiform um, larva and the paper like spots will be the symptoms of the larval stage and uh, for uh, management of this pest uh, uh, mainly the mother moth examination is the main and uh, disinfection of the rearing house uh, and uh, 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 feeding the uh, silkworms uh, the healthy leaves and uh, less uh, moisture leaves will be most important and uh, uh, molting care molting care means before uh, after when 85% of the larvae settle for molting we should stop feeding and and the molting uh, bed should not be disturbed and uh, sprayed with the slaker uh, slaker lime and after 95% of the larvae come out of uh, come out of the molting we have to spray vijayata resham jyoti uh, bed disinfectants uh, so that uh, the any uh, from uh, uh, the silkworm can be escaped from any type of diseases including uh, febrile uh, fletcheri gresseri or muscadine disease so so these are the main, uh, main management practices we need to take uh, uh, for disease management okay the bacterial disease is called fletcheri and uh, the um, the symptoms include uh, uh, the larva become uh, 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 flaccid skin and uh, uh, initially the head become more size than the body and uh, later uh, when the larva will die the body contents will turn black and uh, um, the death of the larva will takes place so this is the symptom of bacterial disease coming to viral disease uh, this is called uh, gresseri the main symptom is uh, intersegmental uh, uh, protrusion of uh, the larval body and the skin become very thin and can be easily ruptured the body fluid inside the silkworm will become milky white and uh, you know, more uh, uh, thick fluid and uh, uh, it, uh, when uh, when the skin easily ruptures the body fluid will come out Uh, as a milky uh, yeah, liquid and uh, the main uh, symptom of this disease that when when larva die it will climb up to some high points and hang upside down that is uh, that is called a tree top disease so this is very important the tree top disease is called a, a viral disease and this is also common in uh, any viral infection in any lepidopteran uh, larva okay another important disease is uh, by fungal diseases uh, those are called muscardine diseases this uh, can be uh, white muscardine or green muscardine and this uh, where the after uh, infection and the fungal uh, pathogen will infect 
the silicones either uh, through skin uh, through skin the, that uh, that means it need not to be fed the other diseases like in febrine grassery fletchery the silicone has to feed on the pathogen but in uh, fungal diseases the uh, uh, insect get infected through the skin itself means the fungal uh, pathogen will infect the uh, insect through the skin uh, by germination fed and uh, once the uh, pathogen get into the silicone the that will multiply and uh, eat all the body con uh, contents and uh, it will uh, reproduce and multiply inside this uh, silicone so after uh, eating all the uh, body contents uh, the silicone will uh, die due to lack of nutrition and uh, uh, after uh, death the silicone will become um, mold like means of mold growth and, uh, and uh, the silicone will become hard uh, um, and uh, the both uh, different um, means uh, if white muscadine is there the uh, death larva will turn a uh, hard white uh, mass and uh, in the green muscadine and the green color uh, will be the mold growth and the silicones so mm, the disease management in uh, silicones is uh, the main uh, mantra in the disease management of the silicones is um, prevention is better than cure we need to take uh, better management before the disease occurs and uh, uh, like uh, disinfections and uh, proper feeding uh, feeding of uh, proper leaves less moisture leaves and uh, highly uh, means uh, well nutrient contents of the leaves is very important to decrease the disease and uh, the molting care as i told uh, uh, in the uh, febrine disease management so molting care is also Im very important and some of the resistant uh, breeds were also identified C uh, identified by csr and ta those uh, um, and can be used for uh, fletchery and uh, grassery disease management. Okay, this is about uh, diseases of the silicones. Coming to pest of the silicones, um, the not uh, many uh, uh, pests of the silicones is there, but the most important uh, major uh, pest of the silicone is Uji fly. Uh, the um, uh, this mulberry silicone Uji fly is called Exorista bombesis and the Muga silicon or uh, Tassar silicon Uji fly is called Exorista sorbilens. These are endoparasitic uh, insects which will um, parasitize the silicones and uh, lay the eggs on the silicone. Once uh, the Uji fly lay the eggs, the eggs will go on, uh, into the uh, the body of the silicones and uh, start feeding on the silicones. After uh, completion of the growth, the maggot will come out of uh, the silicones through uh, while this process, the, the they will cause death of the silicone. This uh, Uji fly will attack uh, from third, usually from third instar uh, silicones to fifth instar silicones, and it may. If they are attacked at late instar, means uh, they are attacked at fifth instar, uh, the larva will not die and uh, it usually construct the cocoons. And inside, um, inside the cocoon, uh, 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 the, the, after uh, formation of the pupa, the maggot will emerge and the fly will emerge out of the this cocoon. So fly also damage the cocoon. So that's why uh, this is a very important pest and it can cause about 45% of the yield loss in the silicone breeding. 45% uh, is very used. So, so um, taking management practices for this uh, Uji fly is very important, which include uh, mainly um, hygienic at the rearing or in and out of the rearing house and uh, netting the doors and windows is uh, most important thing uh, for management of this pest. And uh, nowadays, uh, different uh, uh, commercial formulations uh, came uh, for management of uh, this uh, Uji fly, which include uh, Uji trap. That is, one uh, tablet uh, can be mixed in one liter of water and can be kept uh, at the doors and windows to trap this uh, Uji fly. And uh, another important biological control, uh, that is Nesolix thymus. This is very important, you should remember. Nesolix thymus is a pupal endoparasite of Uji fly which can be uh, uh, usual, uh, usually augmented uh, near the rearing house and uh, near the manure pits of the, uh, around the rearing house. 
to uh, parasitize the pupal stages uh, that um, uh, uh, nesolix thymus uh, uh, eggs can be obtained uh, procured from csr and ta if we place the order okay that uh, is another important biological control and the uh, og side is uh, another important uh, this uh, ov uh, ov side for uh, og flies and uh, it can be um, uh, sprayed or applied on the uh, silicon surfaces uh, from third instar onwards for about uh, three days once and uh, this will re again uh, reduce the uh, means uh, cause the death of the og fly eggs or uh, avoid the egg laying of the Uji fly. So these are the management uh, uh, for uh, Uji fly, uh, fly attack. And uh, another important pest is uh, Dermistrid beetle. This is a pest of uh, usually uh, storage of the cocoons. Uh, when it is uh, stored, it um, the Dermistrid beetle usually uh, make holes uh, the cocoons. So the main, uh, if uh, Dermistrid beetle make the holes means the again, here uh, we cannot get the continuous uh, thread of the silk. So that's why this is uh, again an important pest of the store, uh, storage. So this also feed on the pupa inside and uh, also feed on the uh, cocoons. Uh, for management of this dermistrid beetle, uh, again uh, netting of doors and windows is important and hygienic at the storage place. And uh, the storage bag should be uh, uh, this uh, uh, treated with uh, delta methrin and uh, stored and uh, um, this uh, um, uh, storage uh, uh, cocoon storage house should be disinfected with melathion. Okay, then uh, ear wig. Ear wig uh, ear wig is uh, important pest in grain ages. This usually pierces the moths uh, uh, means uh, female moths and uh, suck the body sap leads to. <coughs> death of the gravid female, thereby reduction in egg production. So uh, for managing this pest, uh, the, again, uh, hygienic conditions are the drainages and uh, all the dust and uh, other materials should be uh, removed uh, from the drainages. Um, uh, that is uh, important for ear wig management and uh, 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 some uh, important uh, uh, Pest uh, in uh, rearing beds uh, is usually ants. Uh, they usually attack in the rearing beds and uh, they'll carry, uh, they'll eat, uh, eat away the silicone and uh, uh, they'll carry the small uh, worms also to their nest. So, uh, for uh, controlling the ants, ant well should be uh, given at the uh, means, uh, legs of the this uh, rearing stand so that ants can be managed. For uh, mount, uh, why, uh, in mounting also, uh, for the chandrikas, we should uh, apply grease or uh, charcoal for the uh, uh, chandrika legs so that to avoid uh, this uh, ant attack, uh, while mounting also, they will uh, attack the silicones. To avoid this, uh, we have to put the grease or any, uh, any uh, uh, this uh, ant repellent material can also be applied another uh, uh, the mammalian pets uh, include uh, this uh, uh, crows uh, while uh, when uh, the chandrikas are the montages kept outside or uh, outdoors so those uh, can be uh, managed by um, uh, scaring away uh, scaring away and uh, monitoring of uh, the crows and uh, lizards are uh, another important pest in the raiding beds as well as uh, the mounting place, mounting, sp uh, mounting space. So uh, netting of doors and windows uh, is again uh, important and uh, scaring away the lizards, uh, squirrels is important uh, from the raiding house uh, to avoid uh, the destruction of the silicones. Okay, uh, this is about the management of pest and diseases and uh, I have explained briefly all about the, the rearing of uh, importance and uh, characteristics, the rearing of different silicones and uh, uh, this um, pest and uh, disease management of the silicones. Uh, we'll take a small interactive session and uh, you can ask any doubt uh, in the sericulture section, uh, which you want, I am ready to discuss with you. Okay, uh, India is in, uh, India, Sorry. 
okay uh, which is the second largest producer of the silk in the world india okay uh, which country is the first producer of the silk in the world china okay um, can you uh, name how much uh, production of silk in india uh, in 2021 14% uh, actually that is a share and the production is uh, about uh, 35000 metric tons okay 35000 metric tons in uh, 2021 and uh, uh, another question is uh, silkom was first to dominate hello 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 silkom was first domesticated in yes ma'am uh, silkom was first domesticated in which country China, China. China. Yeah, China. And uh, what is the color of Moga silk? Golden. 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 Okay. Uh, the brick red is uh, uh, is the color of which silk? Eri. Eri. Eri silk. Um, Eri silk. What is uh, Tassar silk from uh, uh, silk uh, color? Copperish. Uh, what are major pest of silkworm? What is major pest of silkworm? Uji fly. Yes. Uji fly. Uji fly. Uh, what is the parasitoid? Means pupal parasitoid of uji fly. Larval pupal parasitoid. Mm, bra- Nasolix. Bra- bras. Ah. Uh-huh. Nasolix thymus. Nasolix thymus. Okay. Ah yes, Nasolix thymus is the um, uh, pupal parasitoid of uji fly. This is again important point. You should remember this one. Nasolix thymus is pupal parasitoid of uji fly. Okay, and uji fly is endoparasitoid of silkworms. Okay. Endoparasitoid. Okay. Uh, Originated now, from Japan, ma'am. Sorry. Hello. Yeah, yeah. The okay. name of uji the name of uji fly. Is uh-huh. the means name of UZ platform? Uh, which is the city in Japan? UZ the city is Japan. Maybe I am correct or not? Yeah, uh, means you are telling UZ city. How, how it how it is, how it is, it's called as UZ fly? Yeah, I uh, really I don't know. Uh, you can uh, educate me. Yeah, tell me. I, I little bit know because he uh, uh, which is the name in city Japan. जपान मध्य सिटी मतलब एग्रीकल्चर ऑफिसर के एग्जाम में ये एग्जाम पूछा हुआ था मैम इसलिए मैंने वो क्वेश्चन दे इसके अच्छा ओके 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 एनी डाउट्स यू आर फ्री टू आस्क एनी डाउट्स डोंट थिंक इज दिस क्वेश्चन इज करेक्ट क्वेश्चन फ्रेमिंग इज करेक्ट नो डोंट थिंक दोस थिंग्स and just ask whatever uh, comes into your, your mind. hello ma'am yeah yeah hello ma'am yeah you can tell uh, during the solving paper mhm hello yeah i am listening during the solving paper uh, 20 uh, uh, 25 questions are uh, means uh, 25 question uh, of uh, that exam will not matlab uh, uh, वो 25 क्वेश्चन जो आते हैं एग्जाम में से वो क्वेश्चन अपने को मालूम रहते हैं लेकिन अपने को वो सॉल्व करने में थोड़ी दिक्कत आ जाती तो हाउ टू एलिमिनेट ऑप्शन इन दैट क्वेश्चन यू मीन लाइक थ्री मींस कुछ क्वेश्चन ऐसे होते हैं जिसके अपन ऑप्शन एलिमिनेट करते कि कर कर करके कर भी आंसर कर सकते हैं या यू कैन डू दैट एलिमिनेटिंग द एलिमिनेटिंग द आंसर इज द करेक्ट मेथड यू कैन डू दैट राइट हेलो ओके यस मैम यस आई 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 डिड नॉट गेट योर क्वेश्चन 
Hello. Means, ma'am, twenty-five percent are questions. Means, twenty twenty to twenty-five questions are very difficult to answer hmm. by student because most of the student have confusion in these twenty twenty-five questions. Last twenty-five questions. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. In Hello. that case, if you are confident, uh, like. Uh, Yeah, about seventy-five percent. If you are confident, means uh, then only you attend the questions because uh, here so negative. To crack these twenty to twenty-five questions. <clears throat> yeah. Means if you are confident that uh, for me it's about seventy-five percent. I am thinking that this is only correct. This is only correct. Then attend. Why is it not clear? Questions. 